Hello, and welcome to Clean Code. My name is David Donahue, and the purpose of this presentation is to review a few of the basic guidelines for writing clean code. As software developers, we know that software can be a complex thing. However, we also know that complex things are made up of many simple things. Clean code is really the articulation of some basic techniques to help us achieve that low-level simplicity so that we can more effectively build the larger, more complex systems. I like to think of it as the common sense that we all need to be reminded of from time to time. So starting off, what is bad code? We've all seen bad code, or if you prefer the term code smell, we've all smelled bad code. And let's be honest, we've all written bad code. But how can we measure that? How can we know that it's bad? Certainly if the code doesn't work, that's bad, but what if it does work? It compiles, it runs, it produces the expected output for the business. Many times, for a client, that's good enough. But as professionals, we know that there's more to it than that. We know that we would be doing ourselves, each other, and the client a significant disservice if we were satisfied with code that just works. We want to make sure that that code is readable and understandable, and that it clearly expresses the intent of what's being written. We know that features will be added, bugs will be fixed, tweaks will be made during the lifespan of this application. So how can we achieve that? How can we make our code more readable and more understandable? That's where this book comes in. This is Clean Code by Robert C. Martin, or as he's known in the industry, Uncle Bob. What this book presents in a very language agnostic way is a set of guidelines and techniques to help us write cleaner, more understandable, more readable, and more maintainable code. In this presentation, we'll be going over a subset of what's in the book. These are the five core fundamental areas that I feel were the most important and the most foundational for writing clean code. We'll start with meaningful names and comments, move on to some examples of error handling and guidelines for functions, and we'll just start to touch upon the guidelines for objects and data structures. So let's take a look at meaningful names. What makes for a good name? What makes for a bad name? Whether we're talking about a class, a function, a variable, an assembly or a project, or an application itself, anything. Certainly we want our names to reveal their intent and to make meaningful distinctions from one another. But more than that, we want our names to be pronounceable and searchable. Of course, for bad names, we, we don't want disinformation. We don't want encodings in the names that aren't necessary. And of course, we don't want to be cute with our names. We don't want inside jokes. So let's look at some intention revealing names. Do the names here reveal the intent of what's going on in this code? Well, let's take a look. We're processing something. Clearly, we're processing a value. And if the value is less than 10, then for whatever reason, it's bad. And using some database, I don't know what, we're looking at, I guess that's a table. Maybe the T tells me that it's a table. I'm not sure what app tells me. And ORD, I'm not sure why that's even truncated. Was it orders, ordinals, ordinances? I don't know. We're looking for some value that equals a value and we're setting something to true. While this code is very simple and it's clear at a technical level what it's doing, the names don't actually tell us what's going on. We don't know why it's doing this. But by simply changing the names, we can make it much more clearly express the intent. So now we're promoting orders. Well, by itself that may not mean anything, but that sounds like a term that someone in the business might use. That sounds like something we can talk about with business users and they would know the logic that should be behind that. We've moved on to a strongly typed order status, so we don't need that unsightly defensive programming check. Instead, we know that our tests and maybe even our compiler will make sure that we're only passing a valid order status. We're using the order database. Well, everyone in the business knows that there's going to be a database for the company that has orders in it. You don't have to be a developer to know which database you're talking about here. And we don't care that we're looking at a table. 
we don't even really care that we're looking at a database, but it's still a decent name. We're looking at orders, and we're looking for orders where the status equals the status to be processed. And we're setting those to ready for processing equals true. By simply changing the names, we express the intent of what's going on in this code. Make meaningful distinctions. We've all written code in button one click. We've all worked with grid view one and grid view two. We've even all used I as our iterator in a for loop. That's just computer science 101. And then if there's a nested loop, we always just naturally move on to J. I've seen it get as high as M or N. Of course, that's a completely different problem than just the names. But also look at these other ones, my data, my other data. What are those? How do I know that my data goes with grid view one and my other data goes with grid view two? Someone might say, well, just look at the markup on the page, look at the form and you'll know which one's which. But you shouldn't have to look at the form. The names should tell you exactly what they're doing. I don't know which grid view is which here. I don't even know what button we're clicking. But by simply changing the names, I can express that information. Now apparently there's a button on the form that explicitly binds data. I don't care what the text of that button is. I don't care where it is on the form. I just know that that's the button that binds data. Instead of grid view one and grid view two, which only told us the order in which they were dragged from the toolbox to the design surface, we now know that we have an orders grid and a more products grid. Having some basic understanding behind us of what this form is doing, we know exactly which one is which. Again, the layout isn't important, just the logical representation of them. And so we know that the orders go with the orders grid and the products go with the products grid. We've even cleaned up these nested loops a little bit so that we're not using some unnecessary iterator that really just makes the code more difficult to read. I don't care about I, I don't care about J, I care about the order, I care about the suggested product. These names distinguish themselves from one another so that we know which one is which, and more importantly, which one goes with what piece of functionality. Use pronounceable names. I took this from an old system I worked on years ago at, at an old bank, and the standard there was to fill the names with encodings. So looking at the encodings here, we're looking at a, a database. It's a bank database. A1, I'm not really sure what that is. Those could just be the first in some series and then the first in another series. And then on that table, we've got, it's it's a bank, uh, ACMA, I'm not sure what that is. And when I get to these other ones, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm lost. I don't know what these encodings mean. But more importantly, what if I needed to have a conversation with somebody about this? Clearly there's a bug in this code and that's obvious what that bug is. But what if I'm a junior developer and it was just a simple mistype of the keys and I, I don't really know what that bug is or why it's not working. And so I walk over to the, the architect's desk or another developer's desk and I say, well, I'm, I'm in Debunker 1 and I'm trying to compare the Stackton to the Gavactin and it's not working. Or would you, would you pronounce the letters themselves in DBBNKA1 or DBBankA1 on Bank ACMA, trying to compare the STACTN to the GVACTN? Again, it, it makes for a difficult conversation. It presents a barrier to communication. But by simply making the names pronounceable, we can now have that more meaningful conversation. Again, the bug is just as obvious, but now we can talk about the code in a more meaningful way. Now, sure, this is a contrived example, but imagine this throughout your code base. Imagine the conversations over the water cooler that you would have if you have these silly, unpronounceable names, where instead you could just say, well, I'm on the accounts database, or the accounts DB, and I'm looking at the accounts in Massachusetts. I'm trying to compare the number on that account with a given account number, and it's not working. Well, the message is pretty clear. I know what a account number is. I know that you should be able to compare them. Let's take a quick look at your code and see, again, what the glaring bug is that we're trying to assign it instead of compare it. But the conversation didn't have that 
that barrier to it. We're much more effectively able to talk about where we are in the code base and what we're doing. Use searchable names. Well, we know that these days in your IDE, you can right click on a name and find everywhere that it's used in the code base. Well, what if you're not in the IDE at the moment? What if you're in a text editor or on the command line? Maybe you're on the build server and the IDE isn't installed there and you just need to find where all of this is being used, where this variable is used throughout the code. Well, if the variable has this generic name like my object, then good luck finding that because chances are if you've used it in one place, you've probably used that same name in lots of places because it's, again, generic. It doesn't have any meaning to it. So just by looking at it, you have no idea what the effect is if you were gonna change something in that code. But by using a more meaningful name, we narrow down that search. We make it just that much easier to find the impact of any given change. Maybe there was a bug and the person running the build on the build server just wants to quickly take a look at it. Or maybe, again, you're on the command line and you just need to quickly find something. Well, by making it searchable, you make it a lot easier to find things. Avoid disinformation. What information is being conveyed here? In this contrived example, we have an angle that we're getting degrees from something to put in that angle, but it's an HP angle? Isn't HP a computer manufacturer? And what are we getting the degrees of? A TR element? Well, TR is a commonly used HTML element. Is that what we're talking about? Well, if it is, what degrees would be on an HTML table row? I don't understand. So we change the names to get rid of that disinformation. Now we're getting the hypotenuse of something. Okay, well that makes much more sense. The degrees could have meant anything. Could have been, I mean, it was an angle, so chances are it was angular degrees, but we're not really sure. But now we know we're getting a hypotenuse. That's an effective name. And we put it in a variable that carries that same name. After all, that's what we're getting from the function. And what are we getting the hypotenuse of? A triangle a triangle that was given to us by something. We don't care that it's an element. We don't care what it's representing on a form. We just care logically what it is, and it's a triangle. Avoid encodings. I'm sure at some point in the history of software development, Hungarian notation was a good idea, but we don't need it anymore. Our tools have grown, our IDEs have advanced, and we know exactly just by right-clicking on something, what its type is, and where else it's used in the application, where it was declared, all of these things. Just take a look at that first line, for example. That line tells me that it's a string four times. It declares it as a string, it encodes the variable name as a string, it sets it to a string literal, and even the variable name itself, product title. I know that's a string. I know a title is a piece of text. Everybody in the business, whether they're a developer, a manager, operations engineer, the CEO, they all know that a product title is a piece of text. They all know that a product price is a currency value. They don't care that it's a double. They don't care if it's instead a decimal, which it probably should be. They just care that it's a price. It is a numeric value. So looking at the rest of this code, how unreadable is this? The DB products database, even in that where clause, it starts to get kind of silly, product, product. And we're looking at a table of products. Well, in this con context, we don't care that it's a table. We just care that it's a group of products. So we get rid of these encodings and it just makes the code easier to read, easier to talk about and write. We're in a products database we're looking at products where the title is the product title and the price is the product price. So we don't need these encodings anymore. They don't give us any information that we don't already have. And finally, don't be cute. If I came across code like this, sure, I would get the joke. I would laugh. I would reminisce about the cartoons of my childhood. And I would immediately delete this code and replace it with something that 
actually has meaning to it. Because how critical could this code be? I don't know. I don't know what it's doing. I don't know what it means to the business. That's all been obscured by some private joke. If you want to talk about Voltron, we can talk about Voltron on break or over lunch or over a drink, but we don't need to talk about it in the code. So keep the jokes separate. Keep the jokes out of the code. So let's move on to comments. People always jump to comments as the saviors of bad code. They'll say that you need to comment this code more, or if you're done writing the code early, take the rest of the time to write comments in it to document that code. But is more comments really the answer? Or is more comments just more noise added to the code? Certainly there are examples of good comments, but I would say there's more examples of bad ones than good ones. As Robert Martin would say, every comment is an apology for not writing code that clearly expresses what you had to put in the comment. Let's take this for example. This is pulled from the C-sharp implementation of the dining philosophers problem on Rosetta code. If you're not familiar with Rosetta code, it's like Wikipedia for code snippets. So what, is, what are these comments adding to the code? What are they explaining? We have these statements on the left that are kind of difficult to follow, and these comments on the right that honestly are just as difficult to follow. In fact, when I was in school, I had a professor who insisted on this format, that there was always two columns, a column of code and a column of comments, and that every line had to have a comment. And it would lead to such nonsense as a line of code that says x equals 1, and then a comment next to it that says set x to 1. Well, that doesn't add anything. In fact, that violates the dry principle. By putting the same piece of information in both code and a comment, we've repeated ourselves. And then, as I like to say, every comment is a lie waiting to happen. What happens if you ever change x equals 1? Are you going to remember to change the comment too? Or is that comment going to be a vestige of old information that's no longer accurate? So we refactor this a little bit. Instead of explaining it in comments, we explain it in the names that we use. We have this single top-level function that is the highest abstraction of what's going on here. If you're familiar with the dining philosopher's problem, this makes perfect sense. If you have both forks, you eat. Then you drop the forks, and then you ponder. Now, what happens for each of those steps in the process is something that gets explained in another function but you don't need comments to tell you what's going on in those functions. They're all small and simple, and they explain just by the name of the function what's going on. So let's take a look at some examples of good comments. Certainly legal comments can be considered good. If you ever worked on open source software or anything that has a license that has to be carried with it during any redistribution, then that's a good comment. That's a comment you have to put there. Or if you're in a company and the company's attorney says that for every piece of code that we write, every code file, we have to put this disclaimer at the top. Maybe not the MIT license as presented here, but some sort of legal text. Well, in business and in life in general, it's usually a good idea to listen to the attorney. Now, many times you might even be able to get away with putting this in some post-processing directives so that you're not even really including it in the code that you're working on, just in code that gets published somewhere. But either way, this is an example of a comment that is useful, and you wouldn't express this in the code. It would have to stay in a comment. Informative comments. Maybe you have a particular implementation for something. In this case, it's a Levenstein distance algorithm for comparing strings. Well, the code that actually compares the strings, the function that does that, probably has some name that means something to the business. You're comparing those strings for a business purpose, after all. So you would leave a comment like this to give a little more information to anyone who has to support this code later on. The algorithm alone might not be immediately recognizable, but by leaving this, 
you give a future developer something that they can Google, something they can search to find more information about that particular algorithm. Maybe your implementation had a bug and they need to fix that bug. Rather than spending the day stepping through the code to see if they can track down that bug, they could look up what that code is actually doing and maybe the bug will be much more obvious. Explanation of intent. Say, for example, you implement something that makes perfect sense. It's completely logical and reasonable that you should implement it a certain way. It passes all the tests, everybody thinks it's a good idea, but when the business starts using it in production, it turns out it's not really having the effect they were looking for. It's not really reducing their costs or helping their bottom line. And as it turns out, some other way of doing things would have a much more meaningful impact on the business. Well, certainly we want to have that meaningful impact, so we're going to change the implementation to that less obvious way. But it's still less obvious, and maybe someday someone else is going to have the same great idea that you had to implement it in a more reasonable way. Well, by leaving this code here, by leaving this comment here, rather, you explain why something was done a certain way, that it had some reason for the business. Clarification comments. Suppose, for example, you're working with a third-party library or a service of some kind, something that you can't modify, and there's some artificial limitation in it. In this one, for example, the number three was some magic number being used by that third-party system, so you can't reuse it. That artificial limitation is going to have to be used in your code as well. So you want to leave a comment here to explain why you have that artificial limitation there, or why there's something happening that doesn't make any sense at all. After all, what if that third-party library eventually went away or was upgraded by the vendor and no longer had that limitation? If, if you didn't explain, either in the code or at least in a comment, why that limitation is there, someone else who's supporting that code might not know. And they might not know that that limitation has gone away. And certainly they don't want to change something in your code, otherwise they'll own it. And so they leave that artificial limitation there for no reason. So you just leave a comment to explain that. Warning of consequences. Note that this does not mean comments like, never touch this code, it works, don't break it. Anytime I see a comment like that, the very first thing I do is touch that code. I try to break it, try to make sure that it works. I want a test to tell me that it works. I don't want a comment to tell me that it works. No, this is for things that you know someone might have a problem with in the future. There might be a bug that comes out in the future. For example, in this, this class is not thread safe, and you know what the side effects might be. Well, right now, the requirements don't say that it needs to be thread safe. It's going to run in a single threaded environment on a single workstation, and it's never going to need that additional complexity. So you don't gold plate it. You don't put in features that are not needed by the business. But being a professional, you know that someday this code could be reused in a multi-threaded environment, and it's a good idea to leave some information behind on what those side effects could be and maybe even suggest how you think it might be fixable. This could also include things like performance issues. You know that this isn't the best performing code in the world, but in the current system it meets all the requirements and it performs just fine in the current environment. But you know that with a little more complexity, maybe a little more elbow grease in the implementation, it can perform better. So you leave a comment there to explain that, so that someday, if it is an issue, the developer working on it can immediately see and can work to address that issue. <sighs> To-dos. I leave this one last as an example of a good comment because while I do use to-do comments, they're sort of a risky borderline case. If you have too many to-do comments piling up in your code, they're no longer good. Where a to-do comment would be useful is, say, you are working on a feature on one day, and you know that the feature you're working on the next day 
is going to relate to this in some way. So you'll leave yourself a little breadcrumb, a little to-do comment that tells you exactly where in the code you're going to need to make a modification tomorrow. But make sure you actually make that modification there. Make sure you don't leave these to-dos piling up. Actually do them. These are not a replacement for an actual work tracking or issue tracking system. And these should not litter your code. But they are very searchable. IDEs can be set to report on these if they have that standard to-do prefix on them. So at the very least, they're a good place to leave breadcrumbs for yourself or for other developers that you know will be immediately or in the near future working on something and you just want to add a little more information for them. So what are some examples of bad comments? Mumbling is certainly a bad comment. Surely this developer was trying to add some sort of information, but they utterly failed to do so. So what value does this comment actually add? None. There's, there's no information being conveyed here, so just get rid of it. Redundant comments aren't needed. This goes back to that, that section earlier where we had the two columns, one for the code and one for the comments. Well, I know that this code is looping from zero to nine. I don't need a comment to tell me that. Misleading comments are even worse. Again, every comment is a lie waiting to happen. Maybe this used to loop from one to 10, but then it was updated to loop from zero to nine. The code, um, the, the code was updated, but the comment was not. And so when you're skimming through this and you see a comment that tells you something, are you going to believe it or are you going to have to verify it in the code? Mandated comments. This doesn't really add anything. Now, sure, for a library that you have to release or some interface that's going to be exposed to other users, you might want to put in something like this to add that little IntelliSense information. But in this particular case, it's not needed. It's mandated, so every function has to have one. And so you end up with exactly this. The developer puts the cursor before the function, presses forward slash three times, and the requirement has been met. And so all this has done is add five lines of noise to four lines of code. And the code itself explains exactly what it's doing. It's getting the sum of two integers. I don't need a comment to tell me that. I wouldn't even need the IntelliSense to tell me that if this was from some third party library. It's pretty obvious what it does. In fact, it's even a private method. So where is this IntelliSense going to be needed? How large and bloated is this class that I can't see immediately what this method is? We don't need these. Journal comments. Absolutely keep these out of your source code. The source control system is where you keep a record of what changes were made and who made them and when. And hopefully you add your check-in comments to add that other piece of information as to why. But looking at this trail here that would be in comments in the source code, okay, over three years ago, uh, David added a function. Apparently there was a bug in that function. And so Jason came along and fixed it. And then the next day, Jason had to go put it back because apparently something else was relying on that bug. So now Jason's two comments here, his two um, lines in this journal trail, cancel each other out. They're not even needed anymore. The change was negated. And then three years later, Michael comes along and just comments out the whole thing because nothing's using it. Well, first of all, commenting out code, that's another bad one. We'll get to that one in a few minutes. But more to the point, this journal now no longer has any meaning in the code. There's no reason for any of this information because it's code that isn't being used. So keep the journals out of the code and keep them in the source control system where they belong. Noise. Again, same thing with mumbling. What value does this bring to the code? Uh, maybe it's an inside joke. Maybe you just wanted to add a little bit of humor. Maybe you've been working on something all night and you just wanted to impart some measure of personality on it to keep yourself sane. But don't do that in the code. 
you can impart your personality anywhere else. But the code does not need this noise. And finally, commented out code, the cardinal sin of unnecessary comments. Once again, it's a lie waiting to happen. Look at this, for, for example. Does this line of code have anything to do with that commented out for loop? No, it's not using an iterator at all. Maybe some previous version of it was, but this code is never going to be uncommented. As it stands right now, it has no bearing on the actual live code that's near it. And so, again, your source control repository is really the place to keep the old code. It's where we can look at the old running testable versions of what used to be. The commented code is just going to rot. It's going to rot very quickly because there's nothing checking it. The tests aren't checking it. The compiler isn't even checking it. It's just plain text. We're never going to uncomment it. It would be easier to re-implement whatever it is that needs to be implemented. So keep commented code out of your code base. Let's move on to error handling. A few basic guidelines for handling errors are prefer exceptions to return codes. Provide some context with those exceptions, some runtime value that would be useful to know. Don't return null from your functions. And don't pass null to functions. Or another way of looking at that would be don't expect null when writing your function signatures. Take a look at this code, for example. There's some error checking in this code, seeing if, the, if no customer was found or if maybe if multiple customers were found, that it will return a negative 1 as the error condition. But what does negative 1 actually mean? What does that tell you? What does that tell whoever's calling this function? Nothing. Whoever's calling this function would have to intuitively know that negative 1 is the error condition, and they would have to wrap every function call in the same conditional statement, checking for negative 1, which is not only a lot of repeated code, but it's prone to error in case you forget to do it. And then otherwise, whereas an exception would cause the system to recognize that an error happened, if I forget to check for a negative 1, negative 1 is a perfectly valid integer. And so the code that receives that negative 1 could continue on about its way, and the error might not surface until later. More importantly, though, just look at the name of this function, get customer ID. If negative 1 is not a valid customer ID, this function has no business ever returning it. It's not called get customer ID or negative 1 if something went wrong. It's just get customer ID. That's all it should ever return. So we tell developers to use try-catch statements, catch exceptions, handle exceptions, things like that. Well, one natural byproduct of this is that sometimes we get code like this. It's pretty clear why this is bad code. That exception is being caught, but it's not being handled. There's a difference between catching and handling the exception. Catching is a language construct. You see it right here that you can catch an exception with these statements. Handling an exception is more of a logical construct, not really pertaining to the language that's being used, but rather it's how do you meaningfully respond to that error. Here, we're responding the same way. If an error happens, we still just return negative 1. Yes, we're using an exception in some way, but we're not handling it, and we're still not providing any meaningful error context. So one possible approach would be to not handle it at all. Maybe this function doesn't need to handle that error condition. It will either return a customer ID, or it will throw up its hands and give up and say, for the name that you sent me, I can't find a customer ID, or at least I can't find a single customer that has that name. Could be zero, could be more than one. In this case, the link exception that we would get wouldn't really tell us that. At the very least, however, this is letting the exception bubble up to become somebody else's responsibility. The application that calls this can handle that exception however it needs to. Maybe it's a big deal, maybe it isn't a big deal. It's not for this function to decide. Another approach, instead of letting the function bubble up, might be to throw a custom exception. In this case, it's not that generic link exception, but it's something that we wrote, something that's custom. 
something that our error logging system might be able to report on, that there was a data exception here. It was an expected possible thing that went wrong. And so it might help us debug this a little bit. Of course, the exception itself still isn't really enough. Because while we've preferred exceptions to return codes, we haven't provided any context with that exception. We don't know what went wrong or why it went wrong. So let's add a little bit of context. Let's say, and this is taking a more defensive programming approach, but still, it might be useful for logging. Let's say that if something is, if the count is less than one, then no customer was found with the given name. Or if the count is greater than one, then multiple customers were found with the given name. Not only do we distinguish between those two because of these custom exceptions with custom error messages, but we're actually providing that runtime value in the error message. So when this exception gets logged somewhere and a developer is notified that an error happened, they don't even really need to debug into the stack trace or jump into the code and try to reproduce it. They see that runtime value. The developer might not even look at the code at all in this case. They might go straight to the database and say, hey, there is no customer with that name. Why are you searching for that? Maybe the logging mechanism for this exception would tell them what user was logged into the system at the time, and he could directly contact that user and ask them what's going on. Or if multiple customers were found with that name, that could be a more serious issue. Maybe there's a problem with the data. You might want to contact the database administrator and say, these should be unique. Why aren't they? So now we have that runtime information. We have that usable context for the exceptions. Don't return null. So in this case, we've changed the code a little bit. Instead of, instead of calling single, we call single or default. And since customer is a reference type, then the default will be null. Well, that doesn't really provide us with a meaningful error context anymore. By returning null, yes, we're not returning a valid customer, we're returning something else, but it's still something else. It's still a magic value, and it's still a magic value that's leaking out of the code block that, that contained it. And null could cause significant errors in the code. Or what might cause even more significant errors is returning an empty object. Now it's a implied null, but it's not a null that the that the code and the compiler can really check for meaningfully. So in this case, we're returning an empty customer object if something goes wrong. Well, if that empty customer object isn't a customer, then again, the getCustomer function has no business ever returning it. But just like with the negative one earlier, this empty customer object might not be immediately recognized as an error. And long after this function is called, the code paths could continue and keep operating on this empty customer object without knowing that it's an error, an indication that something went wrong. And it would cause some other error down the line, making this much more difficult to debug. So this brings us back to the defensive programming approach where we're returning exceptions, or throwing exceptions rather, which have useful context in them. In fact, in this case, we've actually created two custom exceptions, invalid data request and invalid data persisted, because it's two different things that may have gone wrong. And our logging mechanism for these exceptions can discern between these two and report on them in a more meaningful context. For example, if this is a user interface that's calling this, some random application where someone can just search for customers, well, if no customer was found, that invalid data request, that's really not a big deal. They just searched for some customer that we don't have. Invalid data persisted, however, that is a big deal because we want these customers to be unique, or at least that's what we're implying with this code. Or if another application was using this, some automated backend process where it should only ever search for customers that exist. It should only ever be given data for customers that it should be able to find here. Well, in that case, invalid data request is a slightly bigger issue. It's something we want to know about because that means that this other backend process is getting information from somewhere that isn't valid. And so this helps us report on that. 
don't pass null to functions. Take a look at this function signature and this usage example for it. The function signature is expecting two objects and two date time values. But is it really expecting those? One of them is optional, and apparently one of the date time values is also optional. Now anyone who's worked with cominterop in .NET, at least prior to .NET 4 where things got a little cleaner, has seen this pattern in a much more obvious and much worse way, where you pass null after null after null to functions. Now passing a null to a function, well, it makes you question, why did you want that in the first place? Why is that even part of your function signature? It's even worse than passing a Boolean flag to a function. A Boolean flag is usually a, a loud indicator that this function is doing more than one thing, and that depending on what you pass it, it's going to have completely different effects. But also in the function call itself, when where you would normally pass objects that mean something, in this case, current object, date time dot now, what would a Boolean or what would null really mean? I don't know what that second argument is when I call the function or what that fourth argument is. I'd have to look it up. I'd have to look into the function signature and figure it out. And that's, that's wasted time, that's wasted effort. We don't really wanna pass these nulls. And indeed, this is a violation of the interface segregation principle, whereby this one function interface, this one signature, is trying to catch every possible permutation of how this function could be used. Or it shouldn't do that. Instead, we should have multiple function signatures. Each one is a separate interface. It's a separate use of what's going on. Now, behind the scenes, there could be in this one class a private function that has that generic interface and that these three functions could just be pass-throughs to that one private one. That's fine. Within the context of that one class, it could be considered a little bit messy, but at least to the external observer, those nasty details are hidden away. To the external observer, we want the function call to express exactly what it is that we're doing. In this case, we're either processing an object between two dates or we're processing an object from a given date to the end of time, or we're processing two objects between two dates. These are all very different things. And by providing these different function signatures, we can discern between those things. We can make meaningful distinctions between them. Speaking of functions, let's take a look at some basic guidelines for those. Functions should of course be small, they should do one thing and only one thing, and they should have only one level of abstraction. And of course, they should have no unexpected or unintentional side effects. How small should a function be? Well, if you ask anybody, you're gonna get different opinions on the matter. Some people might say that a function should be no larger than one view within your IDE, with one, one page of what you can fit on your monitor. Of course, different screens have different resolutions, so that's kind of subjective. Some people might assign arbitrary numbers to a, a size of a function. It should be no more than 10 lines long, or no more than 20 lines long, or no more than five lines long. Of course, do they count the line for the function signature? Do they count the brackets? It's still kind of arbitrary. Robert Martin would say that a function should be small. And when it's small, it should be even smaller than that. I might say that a function should be large enough, but no larger. By now, you've probably noticed what's on display here is a function that is clearly far too large. This was taken from a blog post by Allende. He's the author of RhinoMox and RavenDB. And what he illustrated here was code from a client that called him at one point and had this problem that they needed him to fix. The problem was that they had this WCF service that was timing out every time they would deploy it, but only on the first call. Every subsequent call would work. So what would be your assumption? Probably the same assumption he had, which was maybe there's a database call behind this and that's taking a while to spin up. It's, it's difficult to initialize that database call and it's taking longer than the timeout of the WCF service. But then with every subsequent call, 
it's already spun up. It's already in the connection pool and ready to be used. Well, that wasn't the case here. Here, this could have been all simple code. No database calls, no file systems, no external services, no I.O. delays of any kind. What was timing out here was the ironically named just-in-time compilation from the .NET framework. As you know, .NET code gets compiled twice, once from your language of choice, either c -sharp, VB, f -sharp, or any other such language, down into IL code, and then from that, when it's first used, the just-in-time compiler for the framework will compile that code down to machine code. Well, that first compilation step, that can take as long as you like, whether it takes a few brief moments or several minutes to compile from your language of choice to the IL code, that's not really a big deal because that doesn't have to happen in real time. But that just-in-time compilation, that does have to happen in real time. And in this case, there was so much code in this one function that it was taking too long to compile it. An interesting statistic that he pointed out on this blog post was that the entire code base for Rhino mocks can fit into 13,000 lines of code. So this one function could contain that entire mocking framework several times over. Clearly, this is an example of a function that is far too long. If you can get a function down to a single line of code, that would be great. Of course, don't sacrifice readability and supportability for that. Don't have vast, complex link statements that you just move into one single line. No, we don't want that. One line of code as in doing one thing or having one level of abstraction. Doing one thing, for example, in this function, we're doing many things. We're creating a new price, we're looping through the shopping cart and the coupon discounts, and we're adding those to the price, we're removing them. We're hitting the billing repository to get some billing information, checking if that information is valid and displaying an error otherwise. In fact, this function is doing so many things that I had to continue it on the next slide. It's charging through the payment gateway, it's checking for success or failure, displaying messages based on all of this. Far too many things for one function to be doing, and that's why this function is too long. So we reduce the number of things that it does. Now, we still have this overarching checkout function, which, according to our code, is actually doing three things. But it's one aggregate atomic process that, does, that has these three steps. And each step then gets abstracted out into a separate function that in turn does the one thing for that step. And in this case, update current total price, well, that also has a couple of steps, each of which should be abstracted out into another function. In fact, there are so many functions here that are doing one thing, I had to continue them on the next slide. Each function doing one thing and one thing only aggregates up into the larger functions that do many things under the guise of a single thing. Speaking of levels of abstraction, this function has to know far too much about its environment. It has to know things that it really has no business knowing. This function should write to a document, and that's all. But instead, just in that first line where it's getting the documents from the document repository, it has to know the database structure of these documents. It has to know how to construct these where clauses so that it can find the document that it wants, when really it just wants that document. Someone else should know how to get it. Some other function should handle that. And then when it needs to add this paragraph to the document, it creates a new paragraph object, and it has to know the structure of that object and what values to give that. It even uses these magic values here, one for the line height, one for the margin. It has to know all of these things before it can add that to the document, which again, write to document, is all that it should be doing. And even at the end, in that, that error condition, it has to know the user interface. It has to know how to display this error to the user, which again, the write to document function should have no business knowing. Something else should handle that. So we abstract out each of these steps into their own functions. We have the current document for the logged in user is a, a private getter here, which has its own logic internally, but logic that is not needed by this write to document function. It's something else that's handling that. This document just wants to know 
Is it read only? I'm going to write to it, or I'm going to display an error. Even that might be too many steps. We might be able to abstract this further, but let's not go crazy on one slide. Constructing the paragraph is another function's responsibility. This just needs to get that paragraph from the string and add it to the document, because that's all it's doing, writing to the document. And then displaying the error, this function should never need to know about the, the user interface and how to display an error. It should have something else do that, because now we can, now we can use this in other applications that have other user interfaces. We can change the implementation of display error without having to change the write to document function. A function should have no side effects. So this authenticate function, what does it do? Well, it checks to see if, if the username and the password match, and if they don't, it'll throw an exception. Otherwise, it'll just silently continue. Except for this other bit down here. It's adding a shopping cart record to the database. Well, why is it doing that? Maybe at some point, someone, someone was adding this shopping cart feature to this application, and they figured, well, someone needs a shopping cart whenever they log into the system because they're going to be shopping. It's an online ordering system. So how do we add that shopping cart? Well, they can't shop until they authenticate. That's the bottleneck. So that would be a great place to put this. Now it's completely transparent. We never have to worry about it. Well, I am kind of worried about it because now the authenticate function is doing something other than authenticating. And it's not telling you that it's doing that. It's a side effect from the function. What if some other application also wants to use this authenticate function? What if there's some secondary administrative site that's internal only? And that, that administrative website, you have to authenticate to it, of course, but you're not going to go shopping on it. But now we're creating this data for no reason. So instead, we split these out into their own functions, each of which does one thing. We have the authenticate function, and we have a create new shopping cart function. Now, if that same developer still feels that in that application, we should create a shopping cart whenever somebody authenticates, because that's the time to do it, that's fine. You can call both of these functions from whatever enclosing code block is calling them. Or you can create a higher level abstraction of authenticating and creating a shopping cart. Maybe something called authenticate shopper or authenticate shopping user. And that could call these two functions internally as aggregate steps of a larger atomic process. But the authenticate function alone certainly should not have that side effect. It should, it should tell you what side effect it's going to have, such as authenticate and create new shopping cart, for example. Now finally, let's take a look at some basic principles for objects and data structures. Data abstractions, for example. What we have here is a class with two public data members. Now we always tell developers that public variables are bad. You should use getters and setters. And so the response is this. But does this really get us anywhere with this object? Is it, is it still an object? or is it just a data structure? Because all it's doing is giving you direct access to its data members. Now, sure, getters and setters like this are better than just direct member access because we have to think about binary compatibility. If we had just public variables and then we had to add some logic to getters and setters for those variables, then that would break compatibility. It would be a breaking change. In this case, there wouldn't be a breaking change. We can replace these auto-implemented properties with custom properties that have all kinds of logic in them. And external to the object, it would never be known. But that's not what data abstraction is about. What data abstraction is about is to not give direct access to those data members, but instead provide functionality that may modify those data members, but it's an internal modification you're more concerned with the external facing interface. Thinking about the real life example of what we're modeling here, a car. If you need to modify the gallons of fuel that are in a car, do you directly manipulate the fuel tank? No, the car provides an interface through which you can inject fuel. 
it is a, a port on the side of the car, and you have a standard interface into that, and you add fuel to it. You don't really care about the internal implementation. You don't care about where that fuel's going. You don't care about how it's getting into the fuel tank or how the tank maintains its capacity. You don't even care about the, the little piece of functionality on the fuel pump that knows when to shut off. That's all an internal implementation that's really not relevant to the external interface. In fact, there's even another external interface, the fuel gauge. Think of that like a read-only reporting mechanism that's calling this class. And again, it's not directly accessing that data. It's, it's an interface. Internally, it accesses the data. Externally, it just shows you something. So instead, we hide these members. Now the passengers and the gallons of fuel are private and we provide an interface to manipulate them. So we're not directly changing these values. We're adding a passenger, removing a passenger, adding fuel. We could have others. We could expend fuel. We could leak fuel. We could have all these other things. But essentially what we're doing is providing access to those members through some interface rather than directly accessing them. That way, all of the logic that operates on these members is enclosed within this car object. The object is providing functionality. It's not just carrying data and assuming that the rest of the application will know how to, how to functionally operate on that data. Robert Martin called this data object anti-symmetry. And in many of his writings, he makes this same point, that objects hide their data, their data behind abstractions and expose functions that operate on that data. So instead of letting you manipulate it directly, they expose the function by which you would manipulate it. They expose that, that interface, that functionality. Whereas data structures are completely opposite. Data structures expose their data and they have no meaningful functions. They might have a couple of helper methods here and there. Maybe a data structure that's a, a view model in some application could have some, some custom function that's relevant to that view. But really, all it's doing is carrying data. It's not, it's not representing that data in a meaningful, functionally rich way. It's just carrying it from one piece of code to another. So we look at something like this. It's a class called customer, but it only has primitive data in it. Even that, that address class, that probably also just has primitive data in it. It's not really, it's not really providing a representation of a customer. It's just telling you the attributes that describe that customer. We might see a little logic thrown in there. For example, this is taken from the auto-generated code in Link to SQL. And so this looks like logic, but it's really not. It's still providing that direct access to the ID property. I mean, sure, there's a private member behind it that you can't access directly, but all the public member does is just get and set that private member. So again, logically, there's no difference. It'll raise some events based on setting that property, but still, it's just a data structure. It's just giving you access to it directly. Now, we could have this be a partial class, as you often see with Link to SQL, where the meaningful functions are in a separate file that we can change as we see fit, and these data structures that are auto-generated are in their own file that can be rewritten anytime you generate it. But now this sort of merges the object and the data structure into a single thing that is really neither an object nor a data structure. At this point, it's you could consider it an object, but it's an object that still gives you unfettered access to every member that it has. Or you could call it a data structure, but it's a data structure that tries to carry all of this rich functionality with it. It's sort of a unpleasant hybrid between the two. So instead, in this particular case, we write our own custom customer object. In this case, for example, we wanted the ID to be immutable. We wanted to make sure that any customer that exists in memory in this application has to have an ID in order to be valid. So we hide the 
parameterless constructor, and we provide a single constructor that requires an ID. And then the ID itself, again, is private. Now, publicly, you can read that ID. We don't mind if you read it, in this particular case at least, but you shouldn't be able to write it. So it's a read-only property. So what this has done is made that ID immutable. Now, a customer in this system cannot exist without an ID. And now, what if you want to update some information about that customer? Well, you can update the contact information by providing new contact information. Now, instead of directly accessing it, you have this function here that it can contain information about it. It can contain logic about it. Now, sure, you could put that same logic in a setter, but as we move into a richer domain object setup here, we want to provide various kinds of functionality. Maybe that setter isn't good enough. Maybe we want to have different function, function signatures for update contact information. One of them takes only one address. One of them takes two. One of them takes an address and something else. A setter isn't going to tell you that. A setter can't support that. So if you have these different methods by which you expect this data to be updated, if you're just giving direct access via properties, then the code that calls this would have to know what those scenarios are and would have to maintain them itself, when really the customer object should be maintaining those. The law of Demeter tells us that each unit should have only limited knowledge about other units and only units that are closely related to it. It tells us that each unit should only talk to its friends, don't talk to strangers, and only talk to its immediate friends. So I saw this question once on Stack Overflow, where someone interpreted that as the law of Demeter says to use only one dot, because if you have two dots in your statement, that means you're going into a second level of abstraction, and you're talking to another neighbor that you shouldn't talk to. So he presented this code, and he said, clearly, the law of Demeter is being violated here. So does this solve that? Does this fix that violation of the law of Demeter? Well, each statement is using only one dot, but it's still violating that law. Now, this contrived example that he presented was you have this house object that is talking to a weather station object, and it wants to get the temperature from that weather station. But what's it really asking the weather station in this case? Because that's its only neighbor is the weather station. It's not asking it for the temperature. It's still asking it for the thermometer, just like it was in the previous example. And then it asks the thermometer for that temperature. Well, what if the weather station ever wants to change how it gathers temperature data? Maybe it wants to replace the thermometer with uh, an infrared laser pointed at a window or a service call to a satellite that's watching watching the weather from orbit. Well, now the house would have to know about that. It's a breaking change. When the house really shouldn't care about that, it shouldn't be asking the weather station for the thermometer. It should be asking it for the temperature. That's the information the house wants to know. So we break this up between these two classes. The weather station exposes a function whereby you can get the temperature. And so the house just needs to call that function. It's just talking to that one neighbor. The house doesn't care about the thermometer. The weather station, while it talks to the thermometer, it doesn't care how the thermometer gets this information. Is the thermometer getting it from mercury or from some other chemical? Or maybe not a chemical at all. Maybe it's, maybe it's just casting some magic spell internally. The weather station doesn't care. As long as the thermometer can return the temperature, that's all it cares about. So you might look at this and you say, Aren't we repeating code here? We have a lot of very similar code between these two classes. And yes, while the keystrokes themselves are being repeated, they're being repeated for two very different reasons. Because it's not just the keystrokes themselves that tell us if something is a repetition. It's functionally how that code interacts with the code around it. Now we have this one interaction between the house and the weather station and another interaction between the weather station and the thermometer. And they're very different things. So while we're using the same keystrokes, we're using them for very different purposes. And we're abstracting this out to only allow these objects 
to know or care about the information that they want. Some other abstraction will handle that. Now, side note, a funny quote I heard on that once was, some Java architect might tell you that with enough levels of abstraction, you never need to solve the actual problem. Maybe the thermometer abstracts it out to the chemicals. Maybe the chemicals abstract it out to their base components. Maybe those base components abstract it out to some other quanta. And so this could go pretty deep. We could have a chain of dozens of function calls, and they all have the same signature. But that's OK, because the alternative would be to have this house class have one line of code with dozens of levels of abstraction, dozens of dots in this line of code, where if anything changes anywhere along that chain, then it would be a breaking change for everything above it. And that's unacceptable. If you swap out your thermometer with another thermometer, whoever's asking you for the temperature shouldn't have to change what they're doing. And so that concludes what we were covering here. Meaningful names, comments, a few tips on error handling and functions, and then just touching upon objects and data structures. And there's a lot more we can cover there. Again, my name is David Donahue. Thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me.